show this to you is because uh, during the elections, 65 million Americans viewed this, uh, downloaded it, or somehow uh, went and watched it streaming on the internet uh, in a two week period. 65 million Americans. Um, only 21 million Americans watch the evening news and television on a regular basis. So three times the number of people who watch ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, all the news channels combined on a nightly basis, three times that number watch this. This was not made by a multi-million dollar news agency uh, or an entertainment agency uh, company. It was made by two brothers with $500 in their garage. Um, they've since become two brothers who've made millions of dollars outside of their garage, but at the time when they made this, they were two brothers of $500 in Santa Monica, California. Um, it shows you the power uh, that is uh, starting to, uh, that the internet is starting to uh, put in the hands of average people uh, compared with big corporations and, and uh, 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 sort of these the institutions uh, of government or political parties. Um, and so that's what I want to start my talk by uh, saying that this isn't about technology. It's uh, not even really about ideas. Uh, I'll get into that in a minute. But what it's really about is we're seeing the largest shift in power in, in world history, uh, in my view. It, this is uh, a shift from the top to the bottom. Power, it's not just um, uh, information, but power is actually being moved uh, by this technology. And uh, the best way to think about this is they continue to tell us that we're in the information age. We are not in the information age. If information and knowledge of different information is power, and if we're in the supposed information age because the internet and technology is putting more information in everybody's hands, then it can't be information. If, if information is power and we're putting more information in everybody's hands, then it, by its very nature, the internet is distributing power, not information. Not just information. And the first sign of this was Napster. Right? The top-down recording industry in the United States with its hands over its ears saying, no, 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 you're not going to... We're not going to change. No, you have to continue to buy the entire album that sucks to get the one song that you really like. And, and people using uh, the internet, uh, millions of them, said, no, we're going to change the way music is distributed. We don't, we're not going to listen to you top, you top down guys. are not going to make the decision for us anymore. We're going to force you to change the way music is being distributed. And um, the recording industry, the top down recording industry was changed by a bottom-up movement of citizens around the world. And today, music, whether the recording industry likes it or not, and they don't like it, the way it's being distributed has been changed forever, and not the way the recording industry would have wanted it to be changed. So when you look at how change is occurring and how power is now being moved to the bottom, um, then what you start to see, particularly in the States, uh, you start to see Havoc being reaped on the recording industry. You see the Dean campaign rise from the bottom up to try to tear down a political system that isn't working for the American people. You see Dan Rather, the anchor of CBS News, being uh, have, being forced to resign by a blogger who uh, who can report that, he, that the information in the CBS 60 Minutes. Uh, Exposing on George Bush was wrong. It was being on forged documents, and uh, the uh, the very top of the network of all his producers are fired or nicely allowed to resign, uh, all by a person on the internet um, by the nickname or the screen name of Buckhead. Uh, <laughs> is, uh, takes him takes him down. So you're seeing a real shift in in in, in power. Uh, because of these technologies. And the reason is, um, the other mediums, and we've gone through this shift before, we've shifted from radio to television, for instance. Uh, uh, there are, in the uh, 
Nixon Kennedy campaign that Leonard uh, talked about a little bit in his uh, uh, excellent presentation. Uh, most people who listened to that, those debates on the radio thought Richard Nixon had won. Most of the people who watched the debates were positive that John F. Kennedy had won those debates. And so you saw a, a shift in power and TV starts to ascend. Um, we're in a similar period now where uh, we're shifting from broadcast one way media to the internet's multi uh, way for us to connect uh, medium and that's going to have a, the same kind of massive change. Back when Nixon was elected, uh, or when Nick Kennedy was uh, elected uh, and television was only three channels, black and white, um, no one would have predicted that we'd have satellites that sent TV to uh, you know, hundreds of channels uh, uh, that we can on demand order movies and that uh, if we want to we can uh, record them to a hard drive and save them for later on. And no one would have predicted those changes. No one would have predicted that politics uh, in most countries either came down to how do you get enough money to buy a lot of ads on television ads on the TV or how do you trick the media to, to think you're creating news to be put on TV. One of the two mechanisms, uh, one of those two mechanisms exists in just about every democracy. So that's where television took us. We're now at the very infant stages of uh, this new democratic uh, bottom-up medium. And you are the pioneers uh, in many ways of the future and how that power is going to continue to progress and grow. And um, I would like it in, in very big terms uh, to think about, because we're not now just doing a shift in media, we really are doing a shift in power. And there's only one real uh, example of this in history, of what I'm talking about, and that's the printing press. It's not radio or television. The printing press was exactly what the shift that we're seeing. You had a bunch of elites, rich and powerful. They were able to hire scribes who would get right for them their own handwritten version of the Bible or any important book or any important document. Prior to the printing press, that's the only people who had the written word were the rich, uh, uh, powerful kings uh, and, and uh, uh, you know some academics, but basically rich enough to have somebody handwrite the book for them. Uh, all of a sudden, the printing press happens. And any, the cost to vary an entry is one person can print a whole lot of Bibles or a whole bunch of pamphlets and very cheaply distribute them, not just to the rich anymore, but to the people. And that starts a massive change in society and the structure of things uh, and in how we move forward. You're now, this is the beginning stages of the same thing, except it's not a one-way printing press, it's a multi-way, two-way, all of us can talk to each other printing press. So if you look at how the first revolution with the printing press changed everything, this new internet blogosphere, uh, connectivity, MySpace, I mean all of these tools combined are in making, um, are going to be an even bigger disruption to the top. The top is not at the top of any party, of any corporation, of any government is not going to like what's coming. So they, they, they're going to resist it um, to a large degree. Uh, even when they want to embrace it, they won't quite know how to embrace it. They'll still talk, many people at the top will talk in sort of brochure talk uh, instead of humanity, human, putting a human face on their corporation, their party, their, their government, and to start to actually interact with people. In the um, Dean campaign, we recognize this um, in the campaign, uh, and we we started out with uh, 432 people who had connected on the internet. Um, most of the other candidates had millions of dollars and were uh, perceived to be the the you know the campaigns that were John Kerry, uh, John Edwards, Dick Gephardt, these all Kerry in particular had millions of dollars and. Uh, we were laughed at. Uh, they, the press believed that we were ridiculous and how could someone with no money that no one knew 
um, ever get off the ground and, and start a campaign. We ended up uh, with 650,000 Americans. Um, we raised $59 million, more of the money than uh, Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton set the previous Democratic record. Bill, he had raised uh, his record, I think, was $45 million, and he had done that um, not when he was the governor, former governor, the governor of Arkansas running for president of the United States. He set that record as the sitting president of the United States running for re-election in 1996. So the Dean campaign broke Bill Clinton's record. And with all due respect to President Clinton, we didn't have the Lincoln bedroom to sell for $100,000 a night. Uh, and he did. Um, uh, if we were doing it with thousands and thousands of Americans giving $10 or $25 or $100, our average contribution was $77. Um, no one had thought previous to this that you could get um, lots of Americans to actually contribute small amounts each to uh, a political campaign. It was thought that that was a crazy idea that would never really happen. Um, so we, we broke through uh, that way. But the reason is, is because of this technology. And that when people say, well, why did you, okay, so Howard Dean is not president of the United States. That's true. Um, uh, but there's two reasons for that. The first is, we are again at this infant stage. And again, it had television, television, if you have the best television candidate uh, in history, trying to run a television campaign in 1952, there weren't enough Americans with television sets. Uh, there weren't enough uh, people, you know, uh, who, who uh, uh, were getting the information that way. Radio would still kill that candidate every single time. We're now just barely, John McCain in the United States was the first real internet campaign in the United States. That was in 2000. In 2000, he had 40,000 Americans endorse him on the net, and he raised a couple million dollars. Three years later, Howard Dean comes along, 650,000 Americans, $59 million. By 2008, the tools, the technology, many of the things that Leonard talked when I talk about um, in terms of uh, the MySpace, uh, social networking didn't exist in 2000. They were just barely coming online in 2003 with Dean, and, and we were going, so these technologies are moving and exploding. And I think you're going to see even more movement, um, uh, you know, bigger groups. In, in 2008, it might be 5 million people and half a billion dollars will be, I mean, that's my prediction, is that half a billion dollars will be raised uh, by uh, someone running for president of the United States in the year 2008. That's how exponential this is growing. Where you come in and where bloggers come in is we're at the very front of this uh, this revolution in, um, in, in move for power. Um, we are the, the people that are at the front lines inviting others in, having a conversation um, with, uh, with, with people about uh, um, the common good, uh, about uh, different policies, and that's not happened before. Uh, most parties in the government Corporations do not have conversations with us. They tell us, even when they're buying the TV ads, about what great, what a great stick of gum you just bought at the pharmacy. Um, they, um, they, uh, 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 when they're running that ad, it's telling you this is the gum you need to buy. It's not, you know, really. There's no conversation happening. So th this is part of the sea change that's going to happen. Uh, how many of you uh, know Wendy's Burgers? Wendy's, it's a, you know, no, okay. Do they have one here? No. No, okay. Uh, did you hear about the woman who found a finger in her soup at Wendy's? <laughs> yeah. You heard about this team here, right? So, to picture the change that's going to happen, um, and most corporations don't, are not ready for this, if, uh, when the nightly news reported that the woman found a finger in her soup at Wendy's, the Wendy's and eating would start losing millions of dollars uh, every week. People in America stop eating at Wendy's. Why? Because, well, <laughs> <laughs> you're trying to avoid finding a finger in your soup. So um, uh, they stop eating at Wendy's, or, uh, and when 
he started to lose money. Three or four weeks later, the news reported that the woman was a hoax and that she was trying to sort of blackmail Wendy's and it wasn't uh, real, that the finger. Wendy's continued to lose money. Why? Because so many people heard about the, the first part, that there was a finger in the soup, and that, that's what they wanted to talk about. And when you went to work the next morning, did you hear about the woman with the finger in her soup? Once you found out that she, it wasn't real, you didn't necessarily go in, go back to the office the next day and go, uh, that wasn't even real, you know, she lied. Okay, so, if you think now about what I just showed you, what happens when two kids with $500, the day after the news reports that a woman found a finger in soup at Wendy's, go into their garage with their machine, their apple, and make a really funny cartoon of cartoon characters biting Wendy's burgers, eating Wendy's burgers. And every time they do, whoo, the finger flies out. And then, and then uh, they're, they're, they're eating the soup, and when they bring the, the spoon up, whoo, the finger goes, the cartoon finger goes tumbling out. And the next scene is they're dancing in Wendy's restaurants, uh, on the tables with Wendy's menu behind them, and they're dancing like this, and they wore the dance to silly music, the fingers disappear, and we're all laughing. And we're sending this message on to our friends in our um, address book, uh, and emailing us, this is funny, you should see this. Uh, and then Wendy's three weeks later, oh, by the way, now they're going bankrupt. Forget about 21 million people seeing it once on the news. We're talking about millions of Americans sending this on to their friends. When Wendy's announces three weeks later that there's a problem here, um, she's made it up. We all are going to feel no responsibility, of course, to recontact all of our friends that we sent the lie to <laughs> and say, you know, geez, I should let you know it's not true. It's not going to happen. Now, you start thinking about this in terms of political terms. Um, the party that unleashes something like this against uh, another party or against another ideology or another idea make it really uh, makes fun of uh, uh, the Republican Party's uh, privatizing the Social Security plan or something like that. And how will the other party react to it? And this brings in the most important thing that you are. And you, you need to, I really think this is important. You're, you're building up credibility every day with the people that read you. Whether it's 10 people or 50,000 people who read your blog, you have credibility with those people. So when this comes, if you create it or someone else creates it, but you comment on it and you say it's true, that's how people are going to believe it's true. They're going to, because they're trusting you, you're building up credibility with your readers as a blogger. And when you say it's not true, they're going to believe you that it's not true until they find out you've lied to them. I mean, you lose your credibility as a blogger, you lose everything. So, um, I want to give you an example because we talked about the, I know the rumors, the, 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 the blog story here in, in Sweden. This problem has existed with every medium that we've ever had. Uh, in the early days of the United States, uh, one of the early presidential campaigns, uh, two uh, uh, guys running for president of the United States. One was Thomas Jefferson, I'm sure everybody here has heard of. Uh, the other one was John Quincy Adams, probably someone else that you've heard a little bit less of it than you've heard. They had a big campaign for president in 1800. And uh, John Quincy Adams, uh, you're all today his consultants with me. And we have a problem. How are we going to go negative on the guy who wrote the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> kind of a problem. <laughs> so we decided, uh, because we would use the best technology of the day, men on horses, and have them run all over the, the early states, screaming at the top of their lungs, Jefferson is dead. Now, if you lived in a distant state, uh, far away from the nation's, you know, 50 miles or more from the nation's capital back then. And um, you hadn't seen Thomas Jefferson for a few months, and the last time you saw him, he wasn't looking that good. 
view was very easy to believe that Thomas Jefferson was dead. What, what happened uh, next then was Jefferson had to put all his people up on horses. And they ran around the country screaming, Jefferson lives, Jefferson lives. <laughs> and they did not even have the technology then to have a picture, to be able to carry a picture of Thomas Jefferson with uh, today's uh, with newspaper, with today's headline, and, you know, uh, Bush long on Iraq, and, um, and uh, uh, today's headline of the day. They didn't have the ability to do that, so um, you just had to think about an average town where some guy comes running through screaming he's dead, and another guy comes running through screaming he's alive. How do you, what do you do? What's real? What's right? Simple. Do I know the guy on the horse? Do I trust the guy on the horse? You're the guy's on the horse. Every day will become more so. Uh, as people lose uh, trust in, um, and they're going to continue to lose trust in the mainstream media, uh, the big media, um, uh, they're going to continue to lose trust in their leaders, um, in, uh, in, uh, in political elites, and in the institutions. Um, and the more that those institutions try to hold on to top-down power, um, the more people are going to rely on peers as the most credible source uh, out there. Uh, and so you have you sort of these peer-to-peer -peer engines that, do, that you're starting to see uh, that are out there. Um, and again, Napster was a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, kind of revolution in the music industry. You're going to see that uh, create more and more uh, uh, in public inner political stream more and more. The, the, the big issue in the United States was and always has been okay once we saw these sort of Napster storms happen. Could you, would people ever leave their machine to actually go do something? I mean, okay, so they'll give Howard D. money or they'll join his campaign and give up their email address and be part of the they go to his blog and comment, but will they actually leave the blog and go into the neighborhood and build a campaign? Um, and this is where uh, the, I think a lot of people were shocked at the success uh, that occurred as the Dean campaign proved, yes, that is exactly what you can do. Leonard uh, uh, talked in his, uh, uh, briefly about the meetup.com, uh, process where we uh, we urged our people on the internet to go to meetup.com, find where their meetup was in their town, um, and sign up for it and then go. Uh, which is what the site allows people to come in is to agree to meet someplace, a, a, a coffee shop, a library, uh, to set up a meeting and then say, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. I'll, I'll go and, and do it. On the first Wednesday of every month, uh, month of the year, uh, 190,000 Americans went, left their homes, left their computers, and went to a meeting uh, somewhere in their town for Howard Dean. Um, and then talk, and then agreed to take some action the following week, the, during the month. And then they would show up one month later and do it again. Um, we on the campaign thought, that this was way too limiting, that what we were doing, uh, uh, Meetup sort of gives each organization one day, you get one night a month and you can call it your day and then they work, you know, it sort of self-organize on the net. But we were getting a lot of people who couldn't uh, come on a Wednesday night they worked, or uh, they were young and the meeting was being called at a bar and um, their parents would not let them go to the bar uh, because they could get alcohol, there all kinds of different reasons why uh, Meetup was a, a very good thing, um, so, but it wasn't quite working. So we created Get Local, we said we're Get Local tools where you put your postal code into our blog and it would immediately tell you of every meeting or any other thing happening in your postal code that you could sign up for. And also, if you wanted to hold a meeting yourself, you could say, you know, I'm having a meeting at the library at 8 o'clock. Who else wants to come? And people then who were in that postal court could sign up. We had the 190,000 people who met using Meetup 
Add to them 175,000 Americans who used to get local tools to meet every day, any day they wanted to, during a given month. So we were running upwards of 300, 400,000 people off our block who were able to use the other tools, the meetups and, and get locals, to actually take political action outside of the blogosphere. And then come back and report on the blog what they had done. Um, we would have some people, some of the meetups would just decide that they were going to clean a river. They are going to put their Dean t-shirts on and go clean a river and see if they could get the local news to come take uh, news uh, pictures with you know, a group of uh, Americans were cleaning a river today and have this person say, yes, we're trying to clean the river, but how's that help get him elected president? We're doing something good for the country. What, what does it matter? You know, uh, so the, they, you know, the, the news thought that was news, right? That the, a political campaign was actually cleaning up rivers instead of vote for me. So that um, what we did was we created this spontaneous sort of bottom-up uh, campaigning that, that I'm talking about was a it's it was the blog and blogs working um, with these did. Not just sort of reporting, but being a place for citizens to actually comment and post as well, and let, let everybody else in the community know what they were doing and what meetings they were having, and the things started exploding off, you know, not beyond the internet. I can one example um, that I like to talk about, and I'll tell two or three other examples, and then I'll try to open it up to questions um, because I think I'd be more interesting in uh, answering them for you, but. Um, we, when I uh, first looked at this, we, one thing that clued us in, we've got to understand we were making this up as we went along. We had no idea what we were doing. I mean, I mean we knew that, that we would sort of stumble onto stuff and go, wow, you know, let's go try to do that again. So um, one of the things that happened to us was we emailed um, uh, 431 people in Texas, Austin, Texas. Uh, the city of Texas, and we had 432 people by this time of the campaign that were for us and signed up on our email thing. So we sent them an email saying, Howard's coming in two weeks. We'd like to see you at the park. We're going to have a talk to you at the park. We'll come and we'll have some food and some beer and we'll talk at the park. Well, we, we thought if we emailed 431 people inviting them to the park and we did there, gosh, if half of them showed up, that would be a pretty amazing thing. 200. I mean, if 75% of them showed up, it'd be 350 people. That would be amazing. We got to the park, and there were 3,200 people in the park. And we were like, what, how did, what, what happened? You know, how did this happen? And it turns out that two people, it's not what you think. Yes, some of them sent emails to their friends saying, hey, he's coming, come uh, with us. But one of the two of the people who were part of that first 431 emails on their own emailed back into the group and said, hey, if he's coming in two weeks, why don't we have a meeting at my house and see how we can talk about how we can get more people there. So the first problem was 100 of the 431 people showed up at his house. And they didn't fit in the house. They just like, what do we do now? So they went into the backyard, and then they said, well, what can we do? And they said, well, what's, what if we leaflet the entire uh, Latino, Hispanic part of town that does not have computers? Let's go leaflet all the poor area of the city, and let's leaflet them and tell them that he's coming and where it's going to be. And, and then let's go uh, stand uh, uh, for a couple of days, uh, two days a weekend, in the richer part of town, with just hand, just standing in the corners and at the shops and handing them, and see what happens. So, 3,200 people showed up. Half of them didn't own computers. Half of them uh, were not never on the internet. Um, when we handed out the clipboards for people to sign, you know that they came and their address and their email address. Uh, over half of them said, "I don't have a computer." That's how we know. We know the 3,200 because that's how many names signed on to the list. And many of them were just their address and phone number with, I don't have a computer. Um, so that the other important organizing tool is to understand that the blog and the 
internet and these tools are sort of jumping off the points for a party or labor to actually organize beyond. I mean, for working people who don't own computers, um, you, you can you can mobilize people who have who feel some urgent need to, to to move the information along. Um, the other thing that's important in this is it's now not just empowering the bottom. There's a, a very good book uh, out, it's from a right-wing blogger in the States, a uh, very conservative blogger, uh, instantpundit.com. His name is Glenn Reynolds. He wrote a book, uh, just came out about a few weeks ago, called, which I recommend even more than Marcos' uh, uh, book, uh, Crashing the Gates. Um, his book, uh, Dave's book, is, uh, is uh, called uh, An Army of Davids. And it's a very insightful, I think, book about what's happening because it goes back to the big top down and the little bottom up. And the big top downs are the Goliaths in the world, in industry, in, in uh, media, in politics. And we know the story of David where the little guy with a slingshot kills, kills the giant. Well, in a lot of ways, what political parties uh, need to, and, and governments need to, and, and definitely corporations need to start thinking about is, are you going to be, remain a Goliath? And while the armies of Davids are being, are growing out there, or are you going to be the slingshot for the army of Davids? Is your party going to be their slingshot? Is your corporation going to be their slingshot? Are you going to be a Goliath like the recording industries? Apple, decided to be the slingshot. The recording industry decided to be Goliath. We're going to, no, 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 you're not going to distribute music this way. But Apple said, well, yeah, we could get iPod, iTunes, you want slingshots? We'll make more slingshots than you've ever seen. <laughs> guess, how many, guess, what, guess which one's winning and which one's losing. So I think, I think that's really insightful in terms of how we think about this is no longer about just spreading information. It's about empowering people, telling them about the tools on your blog, not just feeding the information. The information is important too, but it's not just the information, it's also learning them that there's a tool you can use. Or, hey, maybe we should hold a meeting over here. When you start to empower them, the more you do that, the faster the movement will grow. And you'll get other people who will leave the meeting at the coffee shop and say, maybe I should start uh, a uh, left uh, wing blog. Or a blog against the right, um, you know, and so you can actually grow it, and you know, hand, you know, have coffee at houses where you're teaching people how to blog. Um, as I know, many of you talk, were taught by somebody or learned something about blogging from someone else in this room. It's a fast way to continue to, to move forward. So this gets to ownership, and ownership is something that people have never had. And I want to give you two quick examples of how the blog gave ownership to people out there, out of the deep life. The first one, very simple. We were really proud of ourselves that we had put up uh, on our blog uh, and our website 50 different signs that you could download for Howard Dean. You know, Iowa for Howard Dean. New Hampshire for Howard Dean for president. California for Howard Dean. Every 56. And, and you didn't have to figure out how to drive 300 miles to the headquarters in Los Angeles to pick up your California for Dean sign, you could just go to your computer, download it, or print it on your uh, printer, or just take the file of a printing Kinko's or some other shops in the United States where you take your file and get stuff printed, and you can get it printed right there, you don't have to drive it go anywhere. So we put this up and we announced proudly how smart we were, how great this was. And um, the first comment on our blog was, you guys are idiots. <laughs> uh, you're running for president of the United States of America, and you do have your 50 signs up, but Puerto Rico also votes for president. And you do not have a Puerto Rico for Dean sign. I'm down here in Puerto Rico, and I can't believe how stupid you are. <laughs> so I'm looking at this on my screen. I, yikes! You know, and I scream out to my webmaster, Nico, 
cut and paste the sign and put up Puerto Rico for Dean. So he does. Three minutes after the guy told me I'm an idiot, we, you're right, thank you, so, so sorry, boom, Puerto Rico's up. About, uh, we've got eight thank yous from Puerto Rico. Thank you, it's great, I've just downloaded my sign, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then uh, the ninth comment was from uh, someone in London. You are a bunch of idiots. <laughs> um, the, you know, six million Americans live abroad in places like London, and uh, we vote, and we get to vote for president too, and you do not have uh, an Americans abroad for Dean sign. So, oh yeah, geez, you're right, thank you very much. Nico, what are the Americans abroad? Uh, Nico was my webmaster, uh, so he puts it up, and uh, the thank you came from a woman in Spain. The important thing here is not the technological story of how, within eight minutes, we found out that we screwed up and didn't have a sign for Puerto Rico and fixed it. We found out that we had, didn't have one for Americans abroad and we fixed it. That's pretty amazing because having been in seven different presidential campaigns in the United States, I can tell you that without the technology, we, Puerto Rico wouldn't even have known we had signs. London and Spain, I mean, forget it, they would never have a clue. Uh, no, what's amazing about it, what was happening was that all the thousands of people out there who were reading our blog for the first time saw a powerful entity listening to them. Not only listening to them, but admitting they were wrong and fixing it immediately. A little person who in Arizona who was a janitor, could tell the top of the Dean campaign, you're an idiot, you don't have a right sign up, and we immediately said, you're right. Thank you for making us better. That is the, the kind of ownership that can only be created by this new kind of message, this new way to talk to each other. That anybody in this country can come up with the idea to make the country better. Once, you, once these people recognize that, we unleashed creativity all over the country. People were, excuse me, sending ideas in. Um, uh, you know, if they were graphic designers, they were coming up with better posters uh, and sending them. They were better than the stuff we were doing in the campaigns. So it was, like I said, it, you know, the, the hundreds of thousands of brains outside the campaign were much smarter than the, than the dozen or so in our national headquarters. That many people, they could spot errors, things that we weren't doing right, and, and tell us what was wrong, and we were able to say, you're right. The, the, um, thank you. The, um, uh, the last story I'll tell about this, and I have to be very careful, okay, first, when I use the word bad in this story, I'm not talking about the flying bats. I'm talking about a baseball bat. You know, the guys that ones they hit home runs with, the Dodgers, the Yankees, etc. So, um, I came up with this idea. Well, first of all, remember that story I told you about the, the people in Texas and they went and knocked on all the doors in the uh, poor neighborhoods. So, it got us to thinking, what would happen if we just emailed the... 300 people we knew in Seattle and said we'll be there in a month and email the 600 people we knew in San Francisco or wherever we went and be there in a month. We emailed like 10 cities and said we're going to be, and told them what day we would be there and we made it the same four days a month away. And then we didn't do anything. We, we didn't send people out to knock out to do anything. We just said we're coming. And we then I announced that we were going to go to these four, 10 cities in four days, and while we were doing it, everybody in the country should watch us because we would raise a million dollars over the internet during the campaign, during those four days. And everybody thought that I was crazy, which I am. So that's, you know, other than that, you need to know that, that I can self, I've saved myself a tremendous amount of psychiatric bills by self-diagnosing myself, I don't know, so I don't. Um, but, uh, 
So we, we went out, and uh, when we hit Seattle, there were 18,000 people in Seattle. But the same phenomenon that had happened in Austin, where the people just on their own, once they, once they realized, <coughs> excuse me, the ownership that they had, they went, once people own something, they're much more involved, much more willing to go out and do, do something about it. So thousands and thousands of people were doing this, but the, new, the idea, remember, the idea of even in the states of giving money to a party or to a candidate, the small people, I mean, average people, $20, was crazy. I mean, people just didn't do that in the country. So the idea of could we raise a million dollars in four days was like, oh, you know, uh, not, not a big, uh, not a lot of people who would make the debt. Um, on the fourth day, um, it became very clear that we were not going to make a million dollars, that we were way off of it. And, and uh, our own people out there realized, you could tell, they realized it wasn't going to happen. Um, so one person in uh, Tucson, Arizona, came on. There was an hour left. It was late at night in New York City. We were about to go to the last event. Um, and the press was angry at us because we had forgotten to feed them during the day. Um, which is a very important note. Remember always to feed the press. It was easier on you to do that. Um, but we didn't feed them that day. They were very angry. So we stopped uh, at a deli, a, a New York deli restaurant, to uh, feed them briefly. And when I walked into the restaurant, my cell phone rang. And my webmaster, Nico, said to me, there's something really interesting happening on our block. And I said, what? He goes, the, a guy in Tucson, Arizona, has said that he gave $25 yesterday. He gave $25 this morning. He's worried that we're not going to make our goal of a million. But he also doesn't have any more money to give. He's, you know, he's sort of at his end. But he will give $25 or more. He'll dig it up somewhere if we agree that tonight, when Howard Dean goes on that stage, if we hit a million dollars, that Howard Dean will carry a red bat onto the stage and say, you did it. So, I'm sitting there, we're not going to make it anyway. I'm a desperate, crazy man. So, I tell Nico, tell them, yes, we will have a red bat. So, as soon as he puts on the block, yes, we'll have a red bat, all these people start saying, I will contribute one more time. I will contribute one more time. People are going this. So I, we take the press over to the, to the park where the rally is. And there's 18,000 people in Bryant Park in New York. And we have this huge screen like this with maybe five times that big and with a projecting, and a projecting website. And the, the money, the, the, the money counter on the site is going $892,000. Just spinning crazy up there till at 10 o'clock it goes to one million three thousand dollars. They did it like they, the response to him saying all the, to them to us telling them about the bat. So just then at 10 o'clock, uh, I I had told a kid uh, my staff earlier, like 45 minutes earlier, go find a red bat <laughs> in, you know, in New York at night. Um, and so he's running. You know, all the shops are closed. And at 10 o'clock, the announcer says, ladies and gentlemen, the next president of the United States, Howard Dean, and he, because he's a candidate on autopilot, um, immediately starts walking up to the stage, because that's his thing, you know, and, and he doesn't have a red bat. And I'm like going, oh my gosh, he doesn't have a bat. The people will be so mad at us because we promised them. And just then, my staffer, Matt, is, I see him running down the street with his red bat in his hands, and he throws it up to Howard Dean, just as Howard Dean gets to the stage, and Howard goes out and just, you did it. Now, CNN, Fox, ABC, all the stations were, were uh, going live with this because they had never seen anything like it before. And I think most of America had no idea what you did it then. To, I mean, the average American who wasn't at that point necessarily following the campaign, okay, and then he went on to a speech. But the hundreds of thousands of people who had been following our blog by this time knew that that idea came 
from somebody 3,000 miles away in a small town in Arizona 45 minutes ago. And they're now seeing not a staffer, not, uh, you know, we're, they're seeing the candidate, the candidate for President of the United States himself take the idea and say, you did it. And at that moment, everybody in the campaign knew they owned the campaign, that this was not something totally generated from up here. They're, the, so I'm trying to give you, I, I don't know if, this is, if these stories are helping, but I'm trying to explain sort of through real things that happen, how you can think about empowering the bottom, letting them know that they own part of this movement too. It's not your movement, it's not the party's movement, it's their movement. And what ideas can you give us? How can we make this movement better? The last uh, thing I'll, I'll do for a few minutes and then um, I'll open up the questions is I do want to get into this notion of ideas and kind of give you a warning um, from my own experience in the States. It is not true that the right, uh, you know, that the Democrats don't have, uh, never had any ideas and the Republicans have all the best ideas. Um, it is true today, it was not true in the past. Uh, and so let me give you sort of a quick history lesson, lesson on the United States political system because um, it may help you avoid the same problem here. The fact of the matter is that it was the left in the United States that came up with every idea, uh, every uh, incredible transformational idea that happened in our country came from the left. Whether it was Social Security for the elderly, Medicare to, uh, for health, uh, elderly health care, women's rights and the right of women to vote, uh, civil rights and the rights of blacks to vote and to participate in society. All of those progressions came from the left. And over 40, 50 years, we ruled um, basically because we have the majority for 50 years. Um, mostly because of those ideas, that we were the uh, party of progress, the party of ideas, the party that brought other people into the process, uh, that cared about the working people, cared about the elderly, and cared about everybody's rights. What happens after you've been in power for 40 or 50 years is something very interesting happens. You start defending your old ideas. It is not that you don't have them. You came, you came up with incredibly amazing ideas that helped the elderly. And so as the nation evolves and there needs to be some uh, new thinking because those were all great ideas when you did them, uh, but you kind of get fat. We're in power. We're running the show. We've been running it forever. And how dare they attack our ideas? That how dare they attack our sacred Social Security program? Um, you know, we, we, we developed that. It was a brilliant idea. And so in the United States, what started to happen was the only ideas, the only new ideas were the Republicans. Uh, George Bush decides his idea is to privatize Social Security. It's a horrible idea, but it's the only new idea, right? The, 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 part, the, the Democratic Party just keep saying, no, Social Security is great, don't touch it, Social Security is great. Well, you keep saying for 50 years, Social Security is great, don't touch it. Social Security is great, don't touch it. Social Security is great, don't touch it. And, and somebody pops up a new idea, even a horrible idea, people start to say, well, that's a different idea, maybe I should listen to that one. And so what, what happens is the party in power um, tends to get it's so entrenched in protecting its brilliant ideas of the past that it does not come up with the new, enough new ideas for the future. And the party that was so defunct and bankrupt of ideas during that whole four or 50 years, never came up with one damn good idea the entire time, suddenly, out of like just desperation, because they've been out for 50 years, starts coming up with, what about this one? What about this one? What about this one? And presents it as new. And some of them are just horrible, but it kind of works because you're just defending old ideas, they're at least presenting new ones. So, I mean, that, that is what I do, for, and, and right, that's why I think sort of this bottom up uh, process of, 
of using the populace to generate ideas, not just your think tank. I mean, I think the think tanks are, 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 are good, the academia and, and, and having institutions that think about things. But I also think that one of the, the great promises of the blogosphere is that is sort of the way the Dean campaign was able to say, hey, you're the people, give us your ideas. And, um, and take the best ideas and run them. I mean, when you see a good idea, say the most amazing thing is when a national party or a national candidate actually takes an idea that everybody in the country knows came from some guy in a village or a small town way out there somewhere. I mean, you know, and, and since he's the one who did it or she's the one who came up with this idea, um, that's a powerful thing. Not only the idea has to come from a university or the institute of, uh, you, you know, of energy or whatever. So um, um, I think the blogosphere has a potential if it's seen as sort of a bubble up kind of thing. How do we get the best ideas in the country from the bottom up? And how do we get people at the bottom to come up? In the United States, you know, um, one of the things I'm working on the hardest right now is global warming. Because I don't believe our government will ever do a damn thing about it, I think. But how do you get, you have to get millions of Americans to decide they're going to join a movement to do something about global warming. That's something that, again, the bot blocks, bubbling it up, telling all the blocks in the United States talking about this issue and getting people to understand it is going to have a lot more power than, a, than an office holder. Um, and I think at this point, though, I would just uh, uh, open it up to questions. I, I cannot tell you how much I believe you're on the front, you're the pioneers, you're on the front lines. What you do and how you do it, how you inform people, how you build your credibility as bloggers is going to have a big effect. Uh, on the new bottom of politics, it will get everywhere. This is not something that is just going to happen in one country. If you look at what happened in South Korea with text messaging and cell phones and, and how uh, they changed, the, the government uh, changed there. Uh, if you look at Dean, if you look at uh, 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 a lot of the, the different uh, 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 bottom-up campaigns that are happening around the world, uh, it's because of this technology, because of blogs, because of the ability to connect with each other. And um, I think the blogosphere is going to be a key component. So thank you, and I'll, I'll take any questions that you have.
fundraising apparatus of the party when you're running for president, and to uh, 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 inherit the organizational apparatus. You know, every block you have somebody who, who organizes for the party. Well, it, you know, the Dean campaign proved that we could raise more money than, than Bill Clinton without selling the White House. And, um, and we can have more people out there organizing than the existing party did. So, uh, so I mean, I think it's, you know, we try to do it inside the party. The next one may be somebody who says, you know what? I mean, in the United States, no, we're going to go outside. Here, I think, well, I think every existing top-down entity in the world had better wake up and realize that the future is bottom-up and empowering people. And so every party has a chance to embrace that and slowly evolve. No one has to, you know, switch overnight, but slowly evolve to letting people in and to empower them to make your party stronger and make the country better through a bottom-up process. I think the, the groups that wear their leadership for, you know, just clamps the heads over their ears and says no, 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 for five years, 10 years, 15, they will be extinct. Sooner or later, doesn't mean they won't win the next election, but the, the entities that do that will go extinct and new entities will pop up, new parties, new, new structures will pop up because you're not putting this genie back in the bottle. You know, we're not going to turn a switch and all of a sudden everything's going to, all the citizens out there are going to go like, geez, you're right, I don't have any power, I cannot use the internet to connect with other people. You know, it's just not going to happen. So I think, um, I, you're right, it will be hard, at least in the early stages, but eventually it will win. But it sounds like you think it's not going to happen inside the existing laws. Not in the United States. I don't think it will happen in the United States. That way. I think, you know, like Al Gore, if Al Gore ran as an independent, tomorrow morning, the Democratic Party would be dead. It would be the internet, everybody would just go, Phew. Yes. How he is now the chairman of the Democratic Party? Has he? Is there something of this transformative power left in the process? Has he brought something of that with him into the party? Is he crashing the party? Um, you know, Howard never got this stuff. I, I don't mean this, you know, his, his job. No, I mean, I don't mean it. I'm not saying mean, his job was to go out and make speak, you know, to do his uh, thing, and we were. It'd be like, you know, all of us in a room creating blogs and, and getting people excited and to sign up and he was out, you know, making his speeches. So he, from a technical point of view, he, he doesn't really understand it that much. Um, um, so the other thing is he's in the, the toughest place to change it. Yeah. The, the most impossible place to change the Democratic Party is as a chairman of the party where you have to be careful because if you say this, these senators may be mad at you, and if you say that, these senators may be mad at you. So it's actually very, you know, better to have not, I told him not to do it, uh, that if I thought, you, you can try to change it from there, but I don't think it will happen there. And so, you know, he said, like, it's an office, it's a straitjacket, you know, it's tied up. So I don't really think he can change much from there. He did, what he's done is there's a whole lot of people who believe in him, out in the net roots that continue to to you know put pressure on the rest of the party to do what Dean says, but those people are the same people who want to kill us because it's threatening them. So it's kind of a very weird struggle on the stage right now. I'm not sure. Uh, I think if there is a party that reforms, it'll be the Democratic Party. But I'm not. I don't really hold a lot of hope right now. They will. It's not just so frustrating to to see the guy. Driving this power to the most central, the most in <laughs> position, which is quite opposite of the, the new force that brought him there. Well, yeah, he, I mean, you know, he, he uh, uh, is someone who I think could change it, but it's, he's in an awkward position. I don't think he will. And he's, he's also, uh, you know, is not. Is I think he's struggling with how to do it. I don't really think he knows how to do it. It's not his fault. It's just he's, not, he's a politician, not a you know, not a visionary about how you do this stuff. So um, yes. Do you know anything about the guys who, or, and girls who used the 
website you have, use the blog, whether they themselves active on the internet, or whether just happening in the suddenly, or whether it's kind of society of bloggers or so on. They, well, you know, when we started, the blogs were just happening. I mean, you know, they had been out there for maybe uh, six weeks, uh, six months, I mean. Uh, I mean, really, I mean, I know they started in 98, but I'm talking about, you know, where people knew what a blog was, or they were like, you know. So, I would say uh, that many of them were, uh, were active on blogs. Uh, my, I can give you a great story. Uh, there was a guy, his name was Matt Gross. He lived in Utah. He, uh, he heard Howard Dean speaking on the radio. Uh, and he just turned his car onto the freeway and drove straight to Washington, D.C., about 2,000 miles. Um, up to Burlington, I mean. Pulled up, and uh, he snuck past security, got past the security desk, and he got into my office. And just as security is grabbing him and saying, you come out, you cannot be in there, he screams out at me, I write for the MyDD block. Now, <laughs> I knew the MyDD block. I knew that it was one of my favorite blocks. And as soon as he screamed out, I mean, you gotta, he's got two security officers grabbing him, and, and he, I write for my DD. I go, you're hired. And he was like, he was turned out to be the, uh, the, uh, the blogmaster. Uh, he created the first presidential blog in history. Um, it was called the Call to Action Blog, the Howard Dean Call to Action Blog. It was our first blog. I mean, I, I noticed as people were talk, showing earlier my first blog, my second blog, my, my ideological blog. Well, our very first blog uh, turned out to be created by him. Um, so a lot of our early uh, people were kids. And that was part of our problem, to be honest with you. I mean, we we had a lot of people who were. Um, it turns out there are a lot of people who are very smart uh, technologists or bloggers. You know, understand blogging and technology, but are not necessarily the smartest politicians. And we have a bunch of very smart politicians who make some of the dumbest bloggers and are internet people on the planet. Um, so, you know, what happened with us is we had a lot of young people, 22, 23 year, old, year olds, who literally, we had 23 year olds who were running a quarter of the nation. We literally, you know, what do you know about politics? Nothing. I, 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 I tell the story all the time. It's like a, you're managing a baseball team, and this kid comes running in the room screaming, put me in coach. And you say, well, have you ever played catcher before? You know, have you ever thrown a baseball? No, but I have a glove. <laughs> you, know, and, you know, so you send these kids who uh, had all this energy, were very smart about the blogosphere and the technology, but did not know, um, you know, how you run a political campaign. So we we struggled with that. We didn't have we didn't have actually, we didn't have a lot of uh, knowledgeable political people inside the campaign. I think in the end, that this the interesting thing about that. Is I often think in the end if we had just a little bit more of a uh, political season, couple of politically seasoned people, that we would have maybe have done better and maybe have actually succeeded. And then I think, no, because if we had any people with political experience, they would have told us, you can't do this, uh, this will never work, uh, we won't let you do this, and we would, you know, it, it, so with a double edged sword, I don't know quite the answer to that. I think, uh, Again, I think it, it may be easier for a party that sort of recognizes we need to start letting this happen a little bit and sort of like so that the cultural shift happens with seasoning and new ideas and blocks instead of sort of an either or. The Democratic Party sort of forced an either or. You're either with the old party or you're part of this weird dean thing. And if you're seasoned and you go work for the weird dean thing, don't ever come have lunch with us again, kind of, you know, thing. So, uh, I think it's better if a, a party at the top starts to understand and says, hey, we are going to let this happen, we're going to let people in and we're going to try to do it. Yeah, both of you back there. One and the other. Do you have the same answer question? Or? No, that isn't okay. so No, I'm kidding. Uh, I thought about negative campaigning. Uh, did you have anyone inside the organization campaigning against you? 
infant triggers. You mean coming on our blogs and stuff? Yeah. Yes, all and, the time. And also, if if they did um, stunts and stuff in the name of the uh, digital president. And one third question: uh, Do you believe that that you have a, a West Wing effect? You know, the television show West Wing is very popular in Sweden, and, and I, I I'm hoping for a West Wing effect in the Swedish election. Did you have a West Wing effect? The, well, the, the interesting thing is, you know, uh, Bartlett ran for president as Bartlett for America. <coughs> so yes, we consciously called, our campaign was not Dean for President, it was Dean for America. And uh, we also had Martin Sheen, who uh, was one of our biggest supporters, he would run around the country. It was, the, the press accused us of trying to like be the West Wing equivalent in real, where we, which was real, you know, the, you know where we get it, imitating the show, it was the show imitating, you know, us. Um, on your first question, the part of the question, um, the first one was yes, and a very interesting thing um, that happened was that's one of the things that sparked all the money. Was what happened was people would come up the, uh, on our web blog site and type horrible things about Howard Dean. Because we allowed comments and we decided we were not going to censor, use censorship or somehow delete them. So if you came on and said, Howard Dean sucks, Howard Dean sucks, Howard Dean sucks, it said, we were not going to do this. Well, think about that. You're in a political campaign. There's all these people out there. They can use the internet too. They hate you. You know, they're the far right. Or, you know, who knows if the guy was a Republican or a John Kerry person. The thing that stopped it was not us. We sat there going, this is another thing about the thousand, hundreds of thousands of brilliant people versus the 12 minds and headquarters who think they're smart. We're sitting there pulling our hair out saying, what are we going to do? How are we going to stop this? One of the people created a website, a different web page, that said, uh, uh, they kept a thermometer of how much money he was contributing every time somebody said bad things about our data on our site. <laughs> and then he posted on our blog that the next time anybody says bad stuff, give what you can, and so that they learn that every time they come here and say something bad, they'll see how much money they were collected. Well, so the guy came and he posts, Dean sucks, Dean sucks, Dean sucks, Dean, and he must have done a word, sat in his word uh, program for four pages of Dean sucks. He cut and pasted it into our comments section. So you see, hey, does anybody know when Howard will be coming to San Francisco? Dean sucks, Dean sucks, Dean sucks, Dean sucks, Dean sucks. Dean sucks. <laughs> Thursday at 3 o'clock, he would be in San Francisco. He was very bad. Well, what happened was um, the first time after the setup happened, uh, $10,000 was donated immediately through, you know, a few thousand people said, and they would post, because you said Dean sucks, I just gave $25. <laughs> Check this link. And so what happened was the first time it was $10,000. The second guy who did it, raised us $100,000 in uh, an hour. And so, and he did it one more time and it did 250,000, and then he never did it, no one ever did it again. So now, and I can say this here because it will not get into the press. So now, so now I'm sitting here at my desk at Dean headquarters and I'm thinking, I'm having mysterious thoughts. <laughs> Dean sucks, Dean sucks, Dean sucks. No, 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 we didn't do it, but, but it, was, it was amazing how the, the community uh, on a block was self-policed the block. I'm not, I'm not talking just about the, you're, you as the blogger, you know, can say what you, you want and things, but like, uh, uh, somebody would come up with a really bad idea. You know, hey, why don't you tell the social democrats to do this? You have, a, you, you're a blogger that, that has alliances with it. Why don't you tell them to do this? And the blogger doesn't have to tell them that's a stupid idea. Three or four other commenters, other citizens will say, you know, John, I like what you usually say, but this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. So there's kind of a weird self-policing thing. They will actually help find ways to fix the problem faster than you can and do it with more credibility than you can. So what happened was most of the, the early Fundraising things happen along ideas like that. With somebody in the community going, like, how do we screw this guy who keeps doing this? 
and realizing, well, if we all give a bunch of money to Howard Dean, he'll stop. And, and now all of a sudden, Americans are giving money to a candidate. I mean, it, that's sort of how it, it evolved. Uh, oh, wait, one other thing. And we did not do that. I mean, your other question is, did we go out and other people's sites and, you know, spread stuff? No, we didn't. We, we made a conscious decision that we wanted to be different than the rest of the politics. Did someone from, you know, from the bottom or, or someone out there, did they do that in your name? Oh, I'm sure they did. I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure they did. But, um, like, I, in my sort of guys on horses story early on, um, you know, that's going to be a problem. You, the, what I say about those things is that always happened. Okay? There's always somebody at the water cooler at work telling you a rumor they heard about the candidate. I heard he was sleeping with somebody. Happens all the time in real life. At a bar, no, no, it happens at the bar, it happens at the water cooler. The only difference is we don't know all the He's dropping in on the conversation. So the only thing that's different is you actually get to hear all the conversations on the, I mean, the, the fact that somebody does it on a blog means you just get to hear about what's actually happening at the water cooler anyway. So if I'm the, if I'm the candidate where that happens to me, I'm sitting here saying, ah, oh, that's what they're saying at the water cooler about it. <laughs> Instead of, how dare they just, well, oh, that's what they're saying, so I have to deal with it. Yeah, I'm sorry, Yeah, it seems to me, it seems to me that uh, most uh, American bloggers that we hear about um, are better fact-checkers than actually putting out news themselves than Swedish bloggers are. I mean, we seem to be commenting on, on news rather than actually putting out news ourselves. So, what's your, uh, what's your advice? How, how, do you, how, do, how do we as bloggers get better at, at being actually better for journalists or actually putting news out ourselves? Well, I mean, I think there's two... You, go, you have to do what your passion is on a blog. Um, you have to do what what you are passionate about. I mean, if you're passionate about sort of finding the coolest story in the paper and bringing it to everybody's attention with a little your thoughts on it, that's what you're passionate about. That's what, I mean, that's real. I mean, you have to do what's real and credible to you because that's how you're real and credible to your readers and how you have the biggest effect. If you're, you know, if you're more opinionated and you want to, you know, take the big issues of the day and put your blog your opinions on them and get other people to, to spread them or to comment on them. That's totally different if you want to be a you know, blog uh, and about, um, uh, the, about just sort of the, just about the idea of people uh, coming together to make the party or the country better and here's some, you know, I want to have a meeting next week. I mean, it's more what you, what's real for you and I wouldn't try to go outside your, you know, what you feel good about. What will happen is the blogosphere, as more people get into it, you'll have uh, other people, you know, with other uh, other areas that they want to talk about. They'll feel the void. One of the things that happened in the United States, here's what is the problem if you're a journalist. Here is the real problem if you're a, if you're a journalist. It's, it's the whole hundreds of thousands of people out there being able to out-resource and out-smart you. And what I mean by or out-be there. So what happens if you're a journalist is, um, it, you know, everybody in this country is an expert at something. I mean, your plumber is an expert at something, right? He's an expert at the plumbing. At least we hope. I mean, I know sometimes. But what I'm trying to say is, so what that's creating, this is where, the, where 60 Minutes got into trouble. They report and they put the documents up on the screen. And all of a sudden, there's an expert on that kind of typewriter, right, who's just sitting at home. He sold those typewriters for 20 years. And he knows them. He's an expert. He sees them on the screen and realizes immediately there's no way that could have been typed by the typewriter of that era. Not possible, the font, etc. So now suddenly, 60 Minutes cannot put up documents without... Now in the past, this expert would have sat there with his black and white TV and he would have seen that it was a fraud, that there was something wrong, but what does he do? He 
calls the CBS switchboard and says there's something wrong. He calls five of his friends, hey, did you see 60 Minutes? It's wrong. No, now he gets to go up on his blog and everybody on the left or the right can link to it immediately and start saying, look at this, he says it's wrong, and look, at, he's an expert, and this is why he's an expert. So suddenly, the, what's going on with journalists is they're, they're, you know, you can no longer on television put B-roll of an F-16 fighter up while you tell a story about an F-18 went down in a crash, right? You, you can't do it because all of a sudden everybody will be screaming on their blogs that they showed us an F-16 with an F-18. So this is this changing um, the way that that works. The second thing that that does is if you, you know, as these experts, um, so if you want to become the expert on pop, you know, this, that's what I'm trying to say. So it's sort of what do you want to do? And as, and as more people understand what, that they have the power to do this and that their voice is going to be heard, I don't think Buck had thought for a second that when he posted about his idea of selective brilliance that this wasn't real, what was going to happen here. You know? So uh, it's going to change a lot. And the other thing, the other thing that journalism is a problem now is that, um, and it's going to be increasingly a problem, is that every, they, there's no news agency possibly put a reporter everywhere we are. So, so you know, now when you have a video phone and a cell phone with a camera and something happens uh, 200 miles from here, but you're there with your, and you take the picture and upload it, you may have a better picture than CNN or whatever the local uh, networks are in Sweden. And that's only going to increase. Um, it's why the bloggers from Iraq I and mean, people are actually living which is the other thing you have. Now we can report on different experiences. Yes, we can have a journalist report to us what the 82nd Airborne is doing, but there's actually now someone who's living in Baghdad in a hut with, um, with a, 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 a ability to post up on the net, net their daily di diary of what it's like living through, uh, living in Baghdad when this goes on. You can, uh, your journalists cannot do that. I mean, it's, it's just a different reporting. So I think, you know, and this is going to happen in politics as well.